we're looking out here at Fisherman Bay, and it's really a very interesting geological and biological feature. It's not that old. It's a relic of the glaciers that were here 10 to 18,000 years ago. If you could imagine this place with water much higher to begin with as the glaciers melted and then waters receding, leaving the bay as a little isolated bay with an entrance in the south and an entrance in the north. What we're facing now is the waters coming back for completely different reasons with sea level rise fueled by uh, climate change, by melting ice around the world. But more often, uh, really what we're seeing here is that our higher water levels are being driven by stormier weather. Storms have been more frequent, more intense, back to back for months. And all of that wind is pushing water into the bay, pushing the tides up, moving water more quickly, and accelerating erosion of the banks and shorelines of the bay as a whole. What we are seeing is very high water in the winter that we've, we've seen periodically high water, but for the first time this year, we had drift 20 feet into the yard and we've never seen that. The level of the water absolutely has changed and it's uh, something we have to think about as we continue to be stewards of the property. What we're imagining right now with the kinds of changes in sea level and storminess that have been forecast, that we'll have high tides that are about three to five feet higher than they are now. And we'll begin to see a really dramatic change in where the tides go during the winter, during the stormy period when they're being pushed the most by storms. The habitats that we're concerned about are not just um, habitats for marine critters, but also for the plants that grow around the bay. So it's a large, mostly enclosed bay that has freshwater inputs from quite a few points around the bay, the major one being right from, directly from Lopez Village through Weeks Wetland. And so around the edge of Fisherman Bay, you get these estuarine habitats, which have unique plant species associated with them. There's a patch of Henderson's checker mallow, which is a hollyhock relative that grows at Weeks Wetland. And it's the only place that it grows naturally on Lopez and one of a few places in the San Juans. And it's a species that needs this mix of fresh and salt water and won't thrive if either of those is removed. But if you push that salt much faster than the fresh comes down and you push the estuarine habitat further up, um, those plants either have to move or they won't survive. And this isn't the only species that uh, is like that that grows around Fisherman Bay. What are we going to do about the habitat that's lost as this change in our shorelines and our uh, stormiest winter tides uh, goes in, the, in this direction? Well, one of the things that we've realized as we've been doing this work is that the habitats that are the most important ones now are probably not going to be able to survive those changes. These are habitats like our salicornia or pickleweed salt marshes, which are very sensitive to the number of days a year that they're under salt water. So very sensitive to their position relative to the tides and there's nowhere for them to go. They are already about as high up the banks as they can get uh, before they run into roads, houses, rocky outcrops. Salicornia um, or pickleweed is very much a saltwater species. It grows in salt marshes, but it can tolerate having fresh water run through it. However, one of the issues here at Fisherman Bay is that that fresh water runs underneath it and takes away some of the substrates. So some of the peat, some of the gravels and sands that that salicornia is growing on. Peat that was built up by thousands of years of salt marsh growth and death of, of pickle weeds piling up from, from millennium to millennium and producing a nice thick brown peaty layer.
that's a wonderful sponge for water and a wonderful platform for the salt marshes around the bay to persist, but it's not going to move. <laughs> and, and so we have this precious habitat that's going to be drowned by rising seas and stormier winters. But can we protect it a little longer? extend its life somewhat and as it disintegrates and and drowns can we build new habitat to replace what we lose and start now rather than waiting for the loss to take place can we use the forces of the water and the movement of sediments now to start building the shoals and bars and reefs that will give this bay and its fish and its crabs and its other organisms a place to live 50 to 100 years from now. And that was the problem that we realized we had and the way we're solving it is by using uh, shellfish beds to start building those bars and shoals and reefs. Now using sediment that's eroding out of the salt marshes that are our current most important shoreline habitat. Creating these breakwaters is both about building habitat out further and to some extent about protecting the habitat along the shore in these salt marshes and estuarine habitats and shorelines um, by breaking up some of the energy of the of the storm tides. And one of the things that oysters do well, they've got all this structure to them, they've got all this complexity in the shells, particularly if they grow straight up out of our oyster reefs. And so as the waves come up toward these sensitive shoreline plants, the energy of those waves is somewhat dispersed along these breakwaters. But here what we're seeing is water soaking into the salt marshes, percolating through, running down beneath the salt marsh peats through the gravels below the salt marsh, the glacial gravels, and taking the crumbling peat out with it into the deeper parts of the bay. That works very well for the kind of intervention that we had in mind, which is having shellfish beds that are like bumpers or barricades, like dams, that catch the water and the sediment as it comes out from underneath the salt marshes and holds that sediment so that it doesn't go into the bottom of the bay, making the bay shallower, but actually helps build up a pile of sediment as a bar on which oysters can continue to grow. What's so cool about oysters and, uh, you know, this concept of of living infrastructure is that they don't just do one thing. They do multiple things and provide multiple benefits in the system. They create habitat. So the bay, as it was developed for human use, lost a lot of shoreline habitat and complexity in the near shore environment. So sunken logs, rocks were removed. All of that provided habitat for forage fish, you know, and other small marine creatures. And so the oyster reefs themselves, as they grow, they have a lot of nooks and crannies and provide some of that, that structure back to the bay. They also can filter water. We've urbanized or developed all around the bay and all those human activities uh, wash off the land into the bay, carrying pollutants and sediments with them. And oysters can actually do a pretty good job of filtering that water and cleaning out the sediments and as well as some of the pollutants from the water, making the bay cleaner. Put it right on the water's edge and I'll swing around and get you. So the first thing that we needed to do was to really be sure that we had precise measurements of the topography around and under the water. And the way to do that was to wait for some really low tides and to do the measurements from a drone using a photo drone that could strip survey the underwater world as it was <laughs> exposed by the tides and then enable us using software to put those images together and use them to build three-dimensional maps of the bottom of Fisherman Bay. 
and then begin to look at how putting structures, putting reefs into that bay would change the movement of water and where water took sediments in the future as tides rise. Particularly when you're working with water, if you nudge a little bit, you create small barriers, slow things down or speed them up a little bit, you can let water do the work of moving sediments around. This can all be done at a very small scale, uh, but you need to have a sense for it. So our uh, landscape architect, Nathan Hodges, is a longtime veteran of our eco-engineering program here in the Sandwood Islands. Nathan's genius in all of this was to take a look and make some measurements, work on his three-dimensional models. Russell asked me to look at the sites that are scattered around the bay and essentially determine the best design for the oyster reefs uh, given the site limitations and the limitations of the materials themselves. His designs are very elegant they are S's and C's and beautiful curved designs that work with the topography, the shape of the bottom, and the movements of currents as we were able to discern them by use of our drone photography and our pedestrian surveys. For each site, it was really a combination of looking at things that were happening on the shore, so runoff, freshwater inputs, erosion of the shoreline, and then looking at things that were happening in the bay immediately adjacent to the shoreline. So the slope of the bay, the way the tides are working at the site, the way the currents work at the site. And then based on those factors, try to deploy these oysters in such a fashion so that they're responsive to those variables. Part of what was important about our construction plan was thinking about how we could modularize the construction of in-water features that could serve as platforms or foundations for living reefs, for oysters. It gives us much greater flexibility, greater efficiency, and brings it much more within the capability of individual landowners to build more, <laughs> to add to it, if it's modularized, and so the basic idea is something like a sandbag, but filled with oyster shell rather than sand. We're a community-based lab, and important to that is working with, with volunteers in a way that both supports the work we're doing, but also gives them an opportunity um, to get something from it themselves. And a lot of that is working with students at the local school. Students were heavily involved in building the modular bags that we put oysters in. We bought our burlap as these big rolls, and then we needed to come up with an efficient way of turning those rolls into bags that would hold a substantial amount of oysters but could be reasonably lifted by a, a single human. And so students came up with a, a clever method for efficiently cutting the burlap into consistent squares, sewing them as rapidly as possible, so having a lot of young people put their minds to how to make this work best was really critical to this project. In the end, we came up with actually very durable bags using very little materials. And then students were also involved in filling those bags. But we were trying to make it such that it wasn't just working with these students for their muscle. They were also part of understanding what this project does, why we're doing it the way we're doing it, and what we expect to get out of it. And it's good to see trying to get kids connected back to the environment, whether it's sewing a bag or putting the oysters out or whatever, but we need to have that next generation cognizant of the value of all of this. Sewn bags filled on shore, stockpiled near the uh, tide flats where each of the breakwaters was to be built, and then a combination of wheelbarrows and sleds <laughs> to deal with conditions of moving these relatively heavy bags out from the shoreline onto the tide flats and placing them, lining them up in accordance with Nathan's designs. The fact that we had some soft sediments already in the bay made it really interesting to use sleds as a way of getting out without doing too much damage and moving a lot of heavy material 
just with human labor, no machinery at all, everything was done by people. We moved something like six tons of oyster shell and lined them up like bricks. These bags do eventually break down and disappear after a few years. So once we actually had our foundations in place and we knew that they were stable, it was a relatively simple but critical matter to get the oysters in. We were uh, delighted to be able to work with uh, Taylor Shellfish, which has the largest shellfish hatchery program in the area and uh, get the 20,000 some odd seed oysters that were necessary to do this right. They all came in a big crate that weighed several hundred pounds and was broken up into little trays that our seeders used to go out and literally seed into the jute bags, cut open a slit in each bag and sprinkle oyster seed in on the tops of the oyster shells where some of them will drift down a little lower, that's okay. It's all part of filling the bag with as much life as possible. And all of the seeding work was done in a single day, a single tide, so that all of those little oysters would be back underwater, wet, cold, and able to respire, to breathe, and to feed <laughs> within a couple of hours of coming out of their, their crate from the hatchery. One of the critical things about this project is that it's all working with interested, enthusiastic, engaged landowners who wanted to host these projects on their property. We worked with landowners all around the Bay who were, you know, very generous and open and willing to, you know, go along with us, which was very exciting. And as we get more and more landowners on board to be trying out these kinds of uh, ecosystem restoration and habitat creation programs, the more we can bring the bay back to a really thriving functional ecosystem, you know, full of animals, fish, but also beautiful uh, for people to use as well. One of the things that I've been looking at as Quiat's botanist is areas where we can enhance the habitat on the shoreline give tools to landowners to build more diversity and protect their shorelines with native species that are adapted to this kind of challenging salty environment. And so they've got the oyster breakwaters in their tidelands, but at the same time they have the opportunity to plant mostly native species. In some cases folks landscaping goes right down to the shore and there may be some more ornamental species that are not invasive that can serve the same function and provide habitat and decrease erosion. We're building habitat from the, you know, the subtitle, the intertidal, the shoreline, into the terrestrial environment, including things like both seabirds and songbirds as well. So thinking this as an integrated system rather than isolated parts. And understanding that as sea level changes, as shorelines change, we need to have a, a backup habitat that is available and that can tolerate those changing conditions. One of the things that really is in our mind all the time, of course, is will it really work? Physically, uh, let's say geometrically, mathematically, our foundations, our breakwater foundations are in a good position. They should certainly capture sediment and build shoals, but the living part of it is a bigger, riskier proposition. How quickly will they build the living crust of, of these foundations? That's really the whole point in terms of having something that will be self-mending, self-repairing, self-expanding, and also a good habitat for things other than oysters like fish and crabs. And unfortunately, because Fisherman Bay is where everything runs to. At this point, these oysters are not being grown for consumption. Until we do a, a broader job of cleaning up this bay, these are building habitat uh, rather than building human food for now. Although we have high hopes that eventually uh, 
this bay will be clean enough that both local communities and tribal communities can eat out of the eat the shellfish out of this bay. When we have our first daytime low tides, April, May in 2023, that will really be the moment of truth in terms of the biological results of our work. First and foremost, we just want to see uh, good colonization of the oyster culch. So we put down empty oyster shell, seeded that with tiny little baby oysters, and we really hope to see establishment of those baby oysters on the culch and growth. Oysters can grow very quickly in this environment, and so if we're seeing good growth and, and good establishment, that will be really exciting. What kind of a community has assembled in and around the oyster reefs that we've built? Is it the kind of community we hoped, one that's diverse, that attracts more birds, more large fishes, and whether it in fact achieves what we really want to do, which is to start building biodiversity hotspots in this bay to replace the ones that climate change will take away from us.